Well, good morning, everyone. I guess if there was a prize that was given for the um, strangest sermon title of the year, I think that uh, today's sermon uh, title might actually get it. Syrian theology. What in the world is all that about? Folks around the office have been asking that question as they've seen the title this week and have really wondered what on earth this is. Let me tell you, you know, a dear friend and mentor of mine uh, preached a sermon using this title more than 30 years ago. I have never forgotten it. It has stayed with me, and the simple message in the Bible that we're going to look at today has helped me again and again. It has stayed with me for more than 30 years. I hope that it's going to stay with you and that it's going to be helpful to you uh, as well. Just before we get into the scriptures, let me say this. There are several members of our congregation from the country of Syria or folks who are of Syrian descent, and you will find today's message to be full of hope, very conscious that the eyes of the world are on the nation of Syria at this time, and its suffering people very, very much need our prayers. We're going to go back in history many centuries, and I want you to open your Bible, if you would, at 1 Kings and chapter 20. 1 Kings and chapter 20. And as you turn to that passage, you will notice if you're looking at a, at a church Bible that the heading tells us that this chapter is about Ahab's wars against Syria. Over these last weeks, we've been looking at the story of Elijah. And we'll be returning to that series, God willing, next week. But before we resume the series, as we're in 1 Kings, I, I want us to look at this very, very fascinating story from the Bible. Now, if the Bible's open in front of you, let's just begin at verse 1, um, and let's walk through the story uh, together. We're told here that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered his army together. We're told that there were no less than 32 kings who were with him, along with horses and also chariots. So think about this. This great Syrian king and 32 other kings are with him, and with the horses and with the chariots, this is an overwhelming force. And Ben-Hadad comes and gives this ultimatum to Ahab, who is the king of Israel. Verse 3, Thus says Ben-Hadad, your silver and your gold are mine, your best wives and your children are also mine. Now, Ahab uh, knows that he is faced with an overwhelming force, and he decides that discretion is the better part of valor. His choice seems to be submitting to Ahab, uh, to, to uh, Ben-Hadad on the one hand, or, or being wiped out by him on the other. And so verse 4, the king of Israel answered, as you say, my lord, O king. Then we find verse 6, that Ben-Hadad ups the ante, as it were, and he sends a new demand, which is that messengers will now come and are going to walk through Ahab's palace. They're going to look at whatever pleases Ahab, and if anything pleases Ahab, these messengers are going to take it, confiscate it, and return it to Ben-Hadad. Can you imagine this? Here are these strangers walking through your home, walking through your palace, and they're saying, do you like this? Well, if you like this, hey, it's mine. It's gone. And at this point, Ahab calls in the elders, verse 7. Ben-Hadad's looking for trouble. So what should they do? Um, I've been compliant, Ahab saying, with all of his demands. Uh, but now this man wants more. This is beginning to feel like blackmail. You give in to one demand, and then the new demand is higher. And where will all this end? Well, the elders who are summoned by Ahab in verse 8, together with all the people, say to the king, do not listen or consent. This was a very courageous piece of advice. And so Ahab sends the messengers back to Ben-Hadad, verse 9, all that you first demanded of your servant, he says, I will do, but this thing I cannot do. And so Ahab draws a line in the sand. And it won't surprise you to know that Ben-Hadad is not pleased. His response in verse 10 really amounts to this, by the time I'm finished, he says to Ahab, there won't be enough dust left in Israel for each of my soldiers to take a handful of your dust back to our own country. 
Well, Ahab sends back another message, verse 11. Let not him who straps on his armor boast like him who takes it off, which is really, as we would say it today, don't count your chickens before they are hatched. So here we have this story. Ahab is a wicked king, but now he is being subjected to blackmail, and surely he has done the right thing. He has gone as far as he possibly can for peace, but Ben-Hadad is incorrigible, and Ahab finally decides he must stand up to him. So now conflict is on the horizon, and remember Ben-Hadad has this overwhelmingly powerful army, and at this moment, verse 13, God steps in. Notice these words, a prophet came to Ahab. Now think about this. This is the grace and the mercy of God. Ahab has been persecuting the prophets. Uh, They've been hidden in caves. He's been in conflict with Elijah. Ahab is a person who has no place for the word of God in his life, but now his own back is against the wall. And what does God do? God sends him a prophet. And the prophet comes with good news. Verse 13, thus says the Lord, Have you seen all this great multitude, the great army of Ben-Hadad? Behold, I will give it into your hands this day, and you shall know that I am the Lord. That is a wonderful expression of God's grace. God does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities, Here's Ahab at this critical moment in his life, and God shows him grace, mercy, and comes alongside and says, I'm going to give you help. And you see the patience of God here, because uh, God had already demonstrated that he is the Lord at Mount Carmel. And now he's saying again, I will show you that I am the Lord. Ahab's as far from God as ever, uh, and yet God is still speaking to him as God is still speaking to you today. So here God says to this man who has done so much evil, a man who has wanted nothing to do with his word, God says, I want you to know that I am the Lord. Well, follow the story with me. Ahab has an army of just 7,000 people. It's a very small number in comparison with Ben-Hadad's overwhelming force. But God is with them, and God is for them. We take up the story in verse 16. See what happened. Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the booths, he and the 32 kings who helped him. Now, folks, it's not hard to imagine this scene. Here is the great king, Ben-Hadad, 32 other guys. They're in these drinking tents, and they're just about under the table to coin a, a phrase. And at this point, as these guys are losing control of their senses, one of the scouts from Ben-Hadad's army comes back, uh, having spotted the movement of Ahab's small 7,000-man army. And they report to these kings in the drinking tent, and they ask for the king's command. Uh, They want to know what orders should be given as to how they should act with this small invading, small army that is is coming towards them. And and the orders that Ben-Hadad gives could only have come from a king in an advanced state of inebriation. That's the only explanation. Look at it, verse 18. He says, if they come out for peace, take them alive. Or if they have come out for war, he says, take them alive. I mean, I ask you, how in all the world, if an army comes out to war, are you supposed to take an entire army that's coming out for war alive? Surely what he meant to say say is, if they come out for peace, take them alive. And if they come out for war, take them dead but the man has so lost control of his senses that he's no longer able to even string two sentences together. And so he gives this incoherent instruction. And without clear instruction, what happens is that the army of Ben-Hadad, with all its vast force, 
is without coordination, it is without direction, it is without effectiveness, and the small armies of Israel win, by the grace of God, an extraordinary, extraordinary triumph. It's an amazing story. But then the key moment comes in verse 23. The king of Syria has sobered up, and now he knows that he has suffered a great defeat. And so there's a sort of post-mortem analysis of the whole thing. And uh, the advisors come in, and this is what they say, verse 23. Well, now, their gods are the gods of the hills. And so they are stronger than we, but let us fight against them on the plain, and surely we will be stronger than they. This is very fascinating. Ben Hadad's advisors were wise enough to know that something miraculous had happened, that Israel's victory against all the odds had come about because of their God. But here's the problem. As they're reviewing what happened, these folks believe that there are many gods, that there are some gods that are kind of for the fields, and some gods for the hills, and some god for the valleys, and some gods for the rivers, and so forth and so on. And, and uh, thinking about these many gods, they assume that each god has some sphere of influence. And with that conviction, they come to this conclusion. Look, we have suffered a great defeat. No one could have predicted it. But it happened in the hills. So, we can only draw this conclusion that their gods must therefore be the gods of the hills. And if they're the gods of the hills, we can come to this conclusion that if we then attack them in the valleys, then their gods will not be able to help them. And the whole situation will be reversed, and we will then win a great victory. That's what the advisors to the king of Syria said. And here we come then to the title of today's message, Syrian Theology. Because theology is very simply what a person says or what a person thinks about God. Syrian theology then is the phrase that I'm using to describe today what ben Hadad's commanders thought about God, what they said about God. And what they said is right there in verse 23, their gods are gods of God the hills. Now, you will see straight away that Syrian theology has three massive misconceptions about God, just in that one little sentence. They said they're gods, plural, as if there were many, but God is one. There is no other. He is the only one that there is. Then they said he's their God, as if he was their God only, when the reality is that he is the creator and he is the ruler of the ends of the earth. And then they said he's the God of the hills, um, as if he were not the God of the valleys also. And they do not grasp that he is the sovereign Lord who created not only hills and valleys, but the entire universe. He is God. So, Syrian theology then limits God. That's at the heart of it. Syrian theology is expressed in all these ways in which people try to put God in a box. People try to make out that he's less than he actually is, as if he was confined, as if he was restricted. Syrian theology does not know that God is the sovereign Lord of heaven and of earth. Now, I want you to notice what happens next in the story. On the basis of these mistaken views of God, on the basis of this flawed and this bad theology, the whole Syrian army comes out the next year in spring, and this time they take their positions on the plains because they've come to the conclusion from what they believe about God that this God will help in the hills but not in the valleys. And the Bible makes it clear that Ben-Hadad had left absolutely nothing to chance. He's got rid of all of the 32 kings, so there's not going to be any more binge drinking in the tents. No more of that. He's appointed new generals. Verse 24, he's replaced the entire army, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. And according to verse 27, the 
the new army is again overwhelming in numbers and it is again overwhelming in power to such an extent, verse 27, that when you looked at the people of Israel camped before them, that's camped before the Syrian army, they looked like two little flocks of goats and the Syrians filled the entire country. And then God steps in again. Verse 28, a man of God came near and he said to the king of Israel, thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said the Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys, therefore, God says, I will give all this multitude into your hands and you shall know that I am the Lord. I want you to notice why God gives to Ahab this second victory. It was certainly not because Ahab was a good king. It was not because Ahab had been saying his prayers. I mean, God gives great promises in relation to prayer to his people. He says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. God moves at times when his people pray, but that is not what was happening here. It was not that Ahab had been praying. On this occasion, God moved in power not because believers had been praying, but because unbelievers had been blaspheming. God moved not because of the effectiveness of his people, but because of the offensiveness of his enemies. God granted this victory not because his people had been praising him, but because his enemies had been belittling him. And God said, I am not going to allow even them to speak about me in that way. And so God moves to vindicate his own name. It's an amazing story. Because they have said, the Lord is a God of the hills and not a God of the valleys. It changed the course of the battle. God moved because of that. Now, here's what we learn from that uh, today. Uh, theology that limits God clearly is profoundly offensive to it. And you know, it is very easy for us to slide today into our own versions of what I'm calling Syrian theology. Sometimes we don't even know it. We make God to be less than he is. We limit God. And I don't want to be someone who belittles God. I certainly don't want to be someone who offends him in the way that I speak about him or the way that I, I think about him. I do not want to slide as a Christian into Syrian theology. So let me suggest by way of application here today, some ways where, some places where Syrian theology might be lurking and some ways in which we can be sure that we speak and think about God in ways that honor him and glorify him and do not offend him. Here's the first. The Lord is God of every person. The Lord is God for every person. And you know, one of the ways in which we can so easily limit God is that we can get the idea that somehow he is the God of people who have great gifts, great privilege, and great advantage in life. And we end up with this version of Syrian theology that goes like this. He is the God of gifted people who have stability and opportunity, but he is not the God somehow of those who have been mangled by hardship and by dysfunction. Or if you think that way, that's Syrian theology. Dale Ralph Davis um, describes this version of Syrian theology so well. He says, you know, it's as if a person says, well, the Holy Spirit may regenerate and sanctify more kosher folks, but he cannot do anything about the absurd medley of genetics and environment and folly that have made me the mass of hopeless twistedness that I am. 
I wonder if that's you. I wonder if you've looked at your own life, what's in you by nature, what's in you by experience, some of what has happened as a result of your own choices, and you say, I am a twisted mess. And you say, well, now, God, he's the God of the people who have had a nice, stable, secure background and have made good choices and have had a marvelous education, but not about me. I'm just messed up. And I'm saying to you that Syrian theology, because he is the God of every person, and that means he is God for you, and there is hope for you in him. He is the God not only of the hills, he's the God of the valleys. He's the God not only of the person with the greatest privilege, he is the God of the person with the greatest need. Then think about this. The Lord is God in every story. Now, the danger here is that we can sometimes limit God to certain kinds of experience. Um, you know, we hear stories of people who have remarkable conversions. You have someone and they've lived a wild life. And then God intercepted that life in a dramatic way. And that person can tell you the date and the time and the place of their conversion. And it is an amazing story. And you hear the story and you say, that's wonderful. But then you say, my story is not like that. You say, my story wouldn't be worth telling from a platform. In fact, it would be very, very short indeed. All I know is that I love Christ and I trust Christ and I know that I'm a sinner, but these things came to me very gradually in life. And here's what you're saying, you see. When you speak and think like that, you're saying, oh, well, he's the God of the dramatic conversion, but he's not the God of the quiet opening of heart. Why would you say that? That's Syrian theology. You look at the book of Acts, and it tells us about the dramatic conversion of Saul of Tarsus, a violent man, and he is saved by a miraculous intervention of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. But then we're told in Acts chapter 16 about a middle-aged, middle-class woman by the name of Lydia who had a little business with purple cloth. And it simply says about Lydia, the Lord opened her heart. And what happened to her was every bit as much a work of God as the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, because the Lord is God of every story. And if you love Jesus Christ and you trust Jesus Christ and you have come to an awareness of your own need of him as your Savior and you're seeking to follow him as Lord, then his power is as much in your, at work in your life as has been in the conversion of anyone else, you would not have come to that place otherwise. He's Lord of every person, not just some. He's the Lord of every story, not just one kind. He's the Lord of every season. Um, think about the seasons of life. There are special pressures when you're young. There are special pressures when you're old, and there are different pressures in midlife. Uh, each stage of life has its own unique challenge, and here's the good news. God is sufficient for all of them. See, when you're young, it's easy to, to, to begin to think like this, this brand of Syrian theology. Well, I'm young. I don't have experience. I don't have maturity. So God has to use someone else who has that. That's Syrian theology. And then when you're old, it begins to go the other way. And, and you say, well, now, God must use the young people. They have all the energy, and, and they have the opportunity, and their lives are much simpler than mine is. I'm older now. I'm in a different kind of a situation. Listen, friend, that is Syrian theology. Whatever stage of life you are at, God can use you, and God is sufficient for everything that you face in this season. So face your challenge, whatever it is, with faith and with perseverance, and you will bring him glory because the Lord is God for every season. Then fourthly, 
The Lord is God for every struggle. Now, the issue here is that we would try in some way to limit God to just certain kinds of battles. You know, he's God when it comes to occasional sins. But when it comes to compulsive sins, do you believe that he's God for you then? Habitual sins. Sins into which you have fallen often, what sometimes are called besetting sins. Uh, Do you know that he is God for you then? Sometimes we end up allowing ourselves this luxury of saying, well, you know, that's just me. I've always been like this, and, and therefore I always will be like this. Listen, that's Syrian theology. The Lord is God in every struggle, no matter how intense, no matter how long it has gone on for you. No matter how many times you have failed in one area or another, you can look to Him and find hope in Him because He is the Lord of every struggle, not some, every struggle. You can look to Him in yours. And if you think you can't, it's Syrian theology, isn't it? He's the Lord of every struggle struggle. Now, here's the fifth thing. The Lord is God in every time and place, every time and place. You know, we read about revivals, how God has worked in remarkable ways in the past, and sometimes we find it difficult to imagine God moving in power today. It's just like Syrian theology, isn't he? He's the God of the of the hills, but not of the valleys. And, and so we begin to say, well, he's the God of past centuries or other places, but not now, not here, not today. We look at the world, and we see how many countries there are that seem to be closed to the gospel. And we wonder about the future of world mission. Conversion to Jesus Christ is illegal in an increasing number of countries, especially in the Middle East and in some parts of Asia. You travel in Europe, you become very much aware of how much of Europe seems to be post-Christian. People see the gospel as part of a discredited past. Uh, They feel that they have moved beyond all this, and they have absolutely no interest, it seems, in moving back. So we look at the church of the past, the history of the church, particularly in the West. We think of massive recovery of truth in the 16th century, powerful pursuit of holiness in the 17th century, awesome movements of the Holy Spirit bringing revival in the 18th century, widespread and fruitful evangelism in the 19th century, but then we come to the 20th century and we see relative decline of the church in the West. And now here we are in the 21st century. We've got the rise of postmodernism and a, a rampant new atheism and most of all the exaltation of the self as God. We may not say it, but it's easy for our hearts to begin to get the idea the Lord is somehow the God of the past, but not of the present and not of the future. And if that thought ever comes into your mind when it does, what you need to say to yourself is this, that is Syrian theology. And it is deeply offensive to God. He is the God of every time, And he is the God of every place. And friend, if we believe this, it will motivate us for endeavors of mission for the advance of the gospel in the greater Chicago area and around the world. He's the God not just of other times and other places. He's God for you. He's God for us. He's God today. He's the sovereign Lord. Now, one more thing just before we close. We followed this story um, in 1 Kings, a story that took place about 750 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So roll the story forward because the Bible is one book and it's important to connect things together. And Jesus Christ is now born into the world. On one occasion, as the Lord Jesus is involved in ministry, the Gospels tell us that Jesus goes north to the area of two cities, Tyre and Sidon. You can read about it in uh, Mark fif uh, Matthew 15 or Mark and chapter 7. And when Jesus took this trip to the north, to Tyre and to Sidon and to that whole region, uh, he met on that occasion a Syrophoenician woman. She's known as the Syrophoenician woman. She was a Syrian lady. And she came to Jesus and she asked for help. And what is so fascinating is that Jesus tested her faith by saying this. He said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the woman says this. Even the dogs, she says, get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. You see what she says? She says, Jesus, you cannot limit the blessing of God to Israel. You can't limit it to one nation. And she was absolutely right. And Jesus rejoices when she says it and commends her for her faith and gave to her the blessing that she sought. For Jesus Christ indeed came first to the house of Israel, but he is the Savior of the world. And the wonderful thing is that the woman who sees that and says that most clearly comes from where? Syria. It's the very opposite of Syria theology. It's wonderful. Roll the story further, uh, further forward again. Jesus dies on the cross as a sacrifice for sinners. He rises again on the third day. He ascends into heaven. Uh, where he is given the name that is above every name. But there are enemies of Christ, and there is one man in particular who hates Christ and hates the church of Jesus Christ, and his name is Saul, and he is about as far from God as it is possible for a man to be. And Jesus Christ appears to him from heaven and saves him. And where does that happen? While he is on the road to Damascus, which is the capital of Syria. Syria. Follow the story of Saul, who now takes the name of Paul. And what do you find? He settles into a small church in a place called Antioch. Now, you need to know there are two Antiochs in the Bible. One is called Pisidian Antioch. It was in the area covered by modern Turkey. The other was known as Syrian Antioch. That's where the church was, and that's where the Apostle Paul became first a leader in the church, and it was the place from where he was sent out on his first missionary journey. So here's the most fascinating twist in the story. You read the book of Acts. And you discover that the great momentum and the great initiative for world mission, the grand enterprise to take the gospel across the face of the Roman Empire, it does not flow from the church in Jerusalem. It comes from the church in Antioch. That's Acts chapter 13 and verses 1 through 3. The gospel came to the world through a church in Syria. The believers there, of course, were largely Jewish, though there were many Greeks who had put their faith in Christ. But as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 3 and verse 29, they were believers who grasped this. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, he's the God of the Gentiles also. I love this. The answer of the early church to Syrian theology came out of a local congregation of believers in Syria, Syrian Antioch. And the church in Antioch became the bridgehead for world mission. He is not the God of the hills only. He's the God of the valleys too. 
He's not the God of the Jews only. He's the God of the Gentiles too. He's not the God of the privileged only. He's the God of the disadvantaged too. He is not the God of other times and places only. He is God for us. He is God for you. And he is God for today. Will you pray with me? Father, deliver us, please, from every trace of what we have called today Syrian theology. Deliver us from every way in which we limit you and see you as the God who can do great things in other situations, with other problems, with other people, in other times and places. We repent of this great offense and ask, Father, that you would make us more like these believers in Syrian Antioch, filled with faith, grasping your greatness and your glory, seeing your power, stepping out in faithful enterprise, attempting great things for God and expecting great things from you. Hear our prayers as we bow before you in worship and in gratitude and in praise. And in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone together said,